Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Wednesday, January 24th, 2018. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A lot of things happening these days that point us to Bible prophecy, where we are on a biblical timeline. Let's have a look at some of these things. Out of the Jewish press, Pew Research Center report poll says 79% of Republicans prefer Israel over Palestinians, compared with only 27% of Democrats. Since 2001, according to a Pew Research Center report, Republicans and Democrats grow even further apart in views of Israel and Palestinians. The number of Republicans who sympathize more with Israel than the Palestinians has increased by 29% from 50 to 79, while the number of Democrats preferring Israel has gone down by 11% from 38 to 27. Hmm. Interesting. Maybe that's why when we have a Democratic president, it seems that Israel is hated by America and the leadership. Now we have a Republican president who recognizes the true capital of Israel, Jerusalem, who supports Israel. The world is acting like, oh, well, America can't be a peace partner for this peace process because America is too partial to one side. Yet most of the rest of the world is partial to the Palestinians. How come they can't be disqualified as being peace partners for the same exact logic that they use against the Republicans? Just makes no sense, does it? You know, the Bible tells us that Satan is the god of this world. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, the God of this world has blinded them to the glorious truth of Jesus Christ. Those who don't know God will side for the ungodly and go against God's people. Out of Jewish press, report says John Kerry urged Abbas to hang on and not give in to Trump. Former U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry met in London with a close associate of Mahmoud Abbas for a lengthy conversation, telling him to hold on and be strong, that he should stay strong in spirit and play for time, that he should not break down and not capitulate to President Trump's demands. Kerry assured this man that Trump will not remain in office for long and there's a good chance that within a year he will not be in the White House any longer. Really? Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, let's see. Out of United with Israel, Al-Qaeda leader calls for knife and car attacks on Jews. A senior Al-Qaeda leader has called for knife and car attacks on Jews in response to U.S. recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Oh, well, if you're going to recognize Israel as the capital of Israel, or recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, we're going to kill Jews with cars and knives. That's our response. There's that religion of peace showing its venomous fangs yet again. Calling for knife and car attacks on Jews. Listen to some of the other stuff this hateful demon said. Um, he warned no Muslim has the right to cede any part of Jerusalem. The Muslims inside the occupied land must kill every Jew by running him over or stabbing him or by using him against him any weapon, or by burning their homes. Every Muslim must know that the Americans and the disbeliever West, and on top of them Britain and France, are the original reason behind the existence of the Jews in Palestine. He said Jews and Americans must be killed. Hmm. Yet, the Democrats will still try to convince you that Islam is a religion of peace. Out of the Times of Israel, Al-Qaeda leader who urged attacks on Jews and Americans put on U.S. terror list. Senior Al-Qaeda leader, this same man, was placed on the U.S. State Department's list of global terrorists a day after he called on Muslims to attack the Jews and the Americans everywhere in response to Donald Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Hmm. Kill the Jews, kill the Americans. How about this? Out of Christian headlines, Atheist Organization Targets White House Bible Study. 
it seems they have a problem with the White House having a Bible study. Go figure. The Freedom From Religion Foundation and Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. <laughs> Sorry. These two groups are suing the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development over information about a weekly cabinet Bible study. Wow. Oh, you can't study the Bible. You can't be doing that, especially if you're using tax money to do so. Well, you can use that tax money to kill unborn babies. You can use that tax money to support homosexuality and transgender and lesbian, gay, bisexual movements. Yeah, that's okay. But Bible study? No, no, no. This is the world we live in, people. People are so opposed to anything godly, anything that represents the truth that comes from this book, from God's word, God's spoken word, God breathed, God inspired. The world doesn't like this. And it's going to get worse and worse. They're going to hate you more and more for trusting Jesus as being the only way to God the Father. They're going to condemn you and persecute you more and more for believing that the Bible is God's spoken word. They're going to hate you for the name of Jesus. He told us this himself. We're watching it happen. We're watching it even now. Out of Reuters, heavy snow humbles the global elites at Davos Summit. They're meeting in Davos, Switzerland to talk about global warming <laughs> and there's a huge snowstorm. They can hardly get in. Heavy snow is burying the place. But they're there to speak about global warming. Sure, last year was one of the hottest years on record. Funny that they're meeting about global warming and they're all having to bundle up in this blizzard. <laughs> Irony. I think it's funny. Out of the Christian Post, Christian churches under attack amid Turkey's bombardment of Syrian region. A lot of key players here. Christian churches in Syria are crying out for help and assistance amid these deadly attacks by Turkish forces on Kurdish areas in the Civil War ravaged nation. Understand something here. The, the seven churches mentioned in Revelation are all in what is now modern-day Turkey. Of course, under the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish, the Muslim Ottoman Empire, Turkey destroyed all of those churches. It seems those who oppose God have always been around. But I believe they're showing their face so much more these days. They're speaking out so much louder these days. Many of them have positions of power in government, high places. These are the times we live in, people. These are the times we live in. Out of the Christian Post, Kenneth Copeland acquires new Gulfstream V jet, seeks $19.5 million for upgrades and maintenance. Now, I'm all for people spreading the good news of the gospel. I am all for um, people reaching out all over the world with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But don't you just wonder sometimes about some of these multi-millionaire preachers if they are really still focused on the gospel or if their God has become the almighty dollar. I just pray that some of these seriously wealthy preachers will be humbled and will stay strong in the word and continue to serve Christ and not serve money because the Bible's clear you can't serve both. In Luke 14, Luke 14, verse 11. And speaking on humility the past few days, 
I think it's important because pride shows its ugly head all over the place. Luke 14, verse 11, this is Jesus talking. He says, for whosoever exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. In the psalm, psalm or Proverbs, one of them tells you, hey, let not your own mouth praise yourself, but let someone else do it, loosely translated. Whoever exalts himself will be abased. He that humbles himself shall be exalted. These are the words of Christ. You know, this world will tell you, oh, you know, to have fame and fortune, you know, wealth and, and prestige and, and stuff and jets and great cars. It's, it's how you'll be happy. You know, the world lies to us. It's just not true. We have to realize not only where happiness is, but where it is not. The answer is not in the world. It's not here in the system of the world. You know, I became a Christian at the age of seven. And then in my teenage years, I pretty much became like the prodigal son. I kind of started living a different way. I went off to college and this was in the early 80s and it all became just like the decade was known for, all about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and wanted to live my own way, and wanted to allow myself whatever pleasure I thought was good at the time. It was a lie. Where was all this happiness found in living like that? You know, but God gives us a different way to live according to his word. In God's economy, in God's kingdom, if we want to be great, we must learn to be humble. Not proud, not arrogant, not self-serving, not selfish. We should seek the fulfillment of others. We should seek what's best for others over ourselves. You know, the way to happiness seems to be by sadness. I don't mean, you know, being in this lamenting state, but when we're sad over our sins. When we regret what we've done, when we confess, when we turn to God and ask for his forgiveness, when we seek a closer walk with Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, Christ was the greatest example. The greatest example, the greatest role model we could ever follow. If we want to find joy, if we want to find happiness, look in the right place. Or look in the right person, which is Jesus Christ. The salvation sent by God himself, the savior of our souls. As you come to know Christ and learn to walk closer with him, you'll find something better than happiness, and that's joy. Happiness tends to lie in our circumstances, but joy can come in the midst of the worst day you've ever had. No one can take your joy away if it's rooted in Christ Jesus. You'll find joy in any circumstance, no matter what's going on in your life. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57 says, but thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Gives us victory, not will give us victory, or not did give us victory, but gives us victory in the here and now. We're victorious in Christ Jesus. We need to learn to walk in that victory. You know, I've I've been an athlete all my life. I've been playing sports since playing on the playground in kindergarten. Um, there's a lot we can learn from the world of sports, from the failures, from the victories of those athletes that are competing at whatever level. Um, whether it's football, basketball, or track and field events, or winter Olympics, which are coming up soon. 
Um, <clears throat> there's been some great, some great leaders we could learn from over the years. I've been very blessed in my life. I have met some really great athletes, some really great coaches. You know, I've met the likes of Tom Landry and um, Joe Montana, and Troy Aikman, and some of the greatest players to play the game of football. I've got to meet them, talk to them, and it's amazing. People like that play to win. And there's a lot you can learn from that attitude if you bring it into the game of life. And if you want to be victorious, it's through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. There was a legendary coach at UCLA named John Wooden. You probably heard his name. Maybe you are familiar with his story. He started his career in UCLA uh, at the young age of like 36, 37. It took him 16 years to win his first championship. Um, his team lost the first round of the championships in 1950, 1952, 56. And he read something that changed the way he thought. He said, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. It's what you learn after you know it all that counts. See, he thought he knew everything about basketball, but obviously he didn't. So he asked some other coaches to help evaluate his players at practice. He hired assistants who would challenge his thinking. He reevaluated everything from the top down. And soon after that, UCLA became one of the greatest NCAA basketball teams out there. Wooden gave some great quotes about life. He said, failure is not fatal, but failure to change might be. That's good. Now, the Bible tells us to renew your mind. Uh, in fact, Romans Romans 12, verse 2, which I was referring to. Let me just read Romans 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Renew your mind. Have you learned from your failures? Or do you, your failures weigh you down? Do you carry around the guilt of your failures? Do you let your failures defeat you or help you overcome? We all have known failure. God wants you to trust him. Stand strong. Keep going. Stay in his word. Learn from others, other like-minded believers that can help strengthen you and encourage you and sharpen you like iron. Your victory is here, and it is in Christ Jesus. Um... In Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, starting in verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. In Ephesians 4, down in verses 14 through 16, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measures of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. We have a rock-solid foundation in Christ. You know, there's so many people of different faiths. They've been swayed by a leader of some, you know, charismatic personality, some great smooth-talking speaker, you know, someone who's eloquent and persuasive and, and cunning. 
Now, you have to be careful. A lot of people have been led astray by people like this. You know, the, the David Koresh's, the Jim Jones, the whoever else that come with another gospel. Our beliefs are grounded in what God's word says. Make certain your beliefs are based on more than the idea of some impressive speaker. Make sure they're based on the rock-solid foundation of Jesus Christ. You know, Paul warned Timothy, who was uh, basically Paul's protege, warned him to beware of false doctrine and those who teach only what their listeners want to hear. 2 Timothy 4 verse 3. How can you recognize a lie unless you know the truth of God's word and can use it as a a litmus test, a measuring stick. You know, knowing the tr teachings of God's word helps guard against being deceived by false doctrine, but also protects you from being intimidated by those who want to attack your faith. So know what you believe. And when you do, you'll prevent yourself from being misled. You'll protect yourself from fear and intimidation. You'll be prepared to answer questions from those who are honestly seeking truth. Always be prepared to give an answer for your faith. You'll be able to be persuasive in presenting what you believe with humility, with truth and love. And it'll deepen your walk and your relationship with Jesus Christ. You have to spend time in God's word and look through a biblical lens with everything that comes your way. Distinguish what's true, what's false. And you'll be able to identify God's truth no matter what lies are presented before you. But we must always be seeking to do God's will. In Luke twenty two forty two, Jesus was saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Jesus was asking God, hey, if there's any other way that we can save mankind, if we can save those other than me dying this gruesome death, let's, let's go that route. Jesus knew it was God, the Father's will, for him to be made an offering for the sins of the world. I mean, several times Jesus prophesied his death and burial and resurrection several times. But because of his relationship with God the Father, Jesus was asking God to accomplish his will in some other way. But at the same time, he was confirming his commitment to do his Father's will and not his own humbling himself. Here was the God of glory in human flesh. He could have called legions of angels to come to his side to help fight against those who were seeking his death. He could have called lightning strikes on everyone there. He didn't use his power he didn't use what was at his command. He didn't use the power that he had. He humbled himself. He died a gruesome death on a cross to save you and me. You know, he knew the Father's will, but he trusted God and knew the best would happen. <clears throat> but you know what? When we pray, Lord, if it be thy will, in response to a promise that God has given us, that's really unbelief. And it's not even remotely related to what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed, if it be thy will. I mean, a lot of people are like, if it be thy will that I marry this person, you know, then show me a sign. Or if it be thy will that I take this job. We have to believe that we receive when we pray. Jesus said this in, in Mark eleven twenty four. There's no way we can fulfill that condition if we don't know God's will in whatever situation we're praying over. So if we're praying, if it be thy will, it takes us out of the active position of believing and it puts us in this passive position of waiting and letting circumstances determine our lives. If it be thy will, Lord, I'll sit back and wait. You're not actively 
trusting. You're not actively pursuing anything. You know, if we're seeking direction in an area where God hasn't already expressed through his word, then we should pray what James speaks of in James 1 verse 5 and ask for wisdom. Ask for wisdom. James says you have not because you ask not. When we have the wisdom God gives us, we can believe that we receive when we pray. And with that knowledge, we can continue our prayer with faith, knowing that God will respond with his will. We shouldn't be ignorant, but understand what the will of the Lord is, Ephesians 5, 17. I think the only time we should pray, if it be thy will, is when we are dedicating ourselves to serving God, to serving the kingdom. Lord, if it be your will that I preach your word, open the doors. If it be thy will, Lord, that you want me to go and build this church over here, provide the way. If it be your will, Lord, that I sell everything I have and give it to the poor. Have you ever said, Lord, here am I. Use me for your glory. Use me for your kingdom. Use me to serve you. I take up my cross and follow after you, Lord. If it be your will that I give you my life, that I give you all that I have, open the doors and I'll follow. I think a lot of people need to pray that prayer. And let God use you in the way he created you with the special gifts and talents and abilities that he gave you that you can use for his kingdom. What are you waiting for? Time is drawing short. I love you guys. God bless you. Good Lord willing. I'll see you again tomorrow.